My name is Claire Wilsden and I'm Professor of the History of Western Art at the University of Glasgow in the School of Culture and Creative Arts and I contributed to the Whistler and Nature exhibition in the form of helping to develop this study day that we've been um, discussing and also contributed to the book that accompanies the exhibition. I came to it from my wider work on history of art and gardens, impressionist garden painting, some of the works done in the Fin de Siècle, and that took me into Whistler's fascinating Rue du Bac garden in Paris, as well as some of his London gardens, which he made the subject of very, very interesting intimate lithographs and drawings in the 18, late 1880s and 1890s in Paris. And it also took me to the wider subject of nature as found at boundaries, margin spaces, because a garden mediates between a house and the city, or between the city and the country. It's a kind of transitional space. And looking at that idea also then, as I say, took me into some of his other works, including coastal subjects and sea views, and also public parks, not just private gardens, and the river. And we have here one of his really fascinating experiments with a new technique, really, that he was trying out, a lithotint, uh, looking across the Thames to the industrial, modern part of the city, Battersea, with its smoke and its chimneys, and so on, and contrasting that with the embankment just near us at the bottom of the picture, where he is actually standing in um, the window of the Savoy Hotel, where he was staying with his poor wife Beatrix, who was very sadly approaching the end of her life. She was desperately ill with cancer, and he looked over from that high room over the balcony of their hotel room and down over what was actually the new little bit of garden that had been created as part of the embankment which had been constructed in the 19th century as part of the whole reinvention of London's drainage and sewers and, and whatnot. And we have this wonderfully poetic kind of image contrasting industry in the background, the products of scientific endeavour and discovery, and this is a kind of little bit of, of nature with trees of the garden and the embankment um, poking up in the bottom. And Whistler's great friend Théodore Duré uh, described this as, as wonderfully transparent, that was the word he used, and we're kind of halfway between day and night, it's that transitional time as well as a transitional space. But I do think it's really revealing that he chose that little bit of nature at the margin in the bottom of his picture, and it's almost as though at this turning point in his and Beatrix's lives, They'd married in 1888, now here 1896, Beatrix at the end of her life. It's almost as he's looking back and perhaps bringing mentally to mind these, these really wonderful times that they'd had in Paris just in the last few years in the Rue du Bac garden, which Beatrix had effectively made really for, for Whistler, installing um, beautiful uh, arrangements with roses, having lovely um, jardinières that she'd planted, for example, with flowers that sort of explode up and form a lovely cloud of colour around her. And Whistler had captured that image of Beatrix tending that jardinière. Uh, he had also captured friends, visitors, people like um, Mallarmé, for example, had come and enjoyed the garden with them, Mallarmé the poet. Uh, de Montesquieu, another great friend, brought a lovely present of several bonsai trees, which um, I think Whistler was a little bit awed by, perhaps he didn't ever illustrate them. Uh, anyway, um, they were there, but there was also um, a thing like a, a dracaena plant, a dragon plant, so Whistler's garden was an interesting mix, really, of, of more informal and more um, stylized types of plant. Uh, a dragon plant was a very spiky thing, and we see it in one or two of his pictures. But Beatrix made the, the porch through which one looked from the house to the garden, so again there's that transitional idea, that interesting space. And in my talk and in the catalogue essay, I've explored some of the kind of implications of, of looking at, at spaces like that, where the border cells of the brain are engaged by these spaces that may be dangerous, may be safe, represent a change of one's circumstance and therefore uh, evoke greater um, mental attention from the viewer. 
bird song is a really interesting aspect of the garden at Rue du Bac because it was almost a little pocket of country, I think, as far as we can tell from period descriptions. Uh, Whistler's pupil Edmund Verpool refers to having, mass having masses of roses there and Whistler himself would go and bury his sorrows as he <laughs> put it in, or as Verpool put it, in this lovely natural environment. So we can readily imagine you know, not just colour, but also sound. And that we know was intensified because Beatrix actually had birds in cages that she kept. We wouldn't obviously want birds kept that way nowadays, but um, think of the sound. One of them was uh, Sharma. In fact, two of them were Sharma birds, exotic Indian birds known for their sweet song. And there's a very evocative drawing by Whistler of Beatrix seeing to her birds. And she's got one of the cage doors open and you can just imagine the sound kind of coming forth from it. And we know that there were human singing sounds coming over the, the walls as well from near, the nearby seminary. Monks um, chanted whenever one of their members was on the way abroad to a placement in a foreign mission because the, monk, the, the monks belonged to the Foreign Missionary Society. And it's possible actually to reconstruct which sounds those were from the monks singing because there, there was a very famous um, Chant du Départ des Missionnaires song for the departure of the missionaries that uh, Guno had composed and that was always sung when one of them went away. So there's that human song mingling with the bird song at a time when Darwin's ideas about bird song being part of the whole evolutionary story, the way in which um, birds attract mates, mark out territory, uh, is in the air and we know Whistler was aware of Darwin's ideas. He refers to the survival of the fittest in one of his comments. Um, it's very likely that he would have been at least, you know, maybe not directly but certainly indirectly aware of the fact that birdsong was the subject of scientific discussion. His brother, after all, was a doctor contributing learned articles to scientific journals. And it's that side that I thought was worth exploring a little in the paper where it's possible to just imaginatively think ourselves back into that overlay of human singing, bird song, scent of flowers, wonderful colours, the whole ensemble of the environment of the garden would really have answered very directly, I think, to ideas about um, the total work of art, in the realm of aesthetics, but equally to um, bird song and human song having a common origin and being, as it were, part of our deepest history as, as a human race. We do have some photographs of Whistler's garden, as well as the, the lithographs, I should say, as well as the lithographs, we have photographs of Whistler's garden, and those give us a fair idea of its structure. And we have period descriptions by visitors like um, Verpal, Whistler's uh, pupil, an artist himself. And we can get a sense that there was a round lawn there with a path, either circular or horseshoe shaped, that went around it. And that was very much the kind of tradition in the uh, modern French garden that the enthusiasm for gardens and horticulture of the day had, had brought into being. Monet shows a similar garden at Argenteuil that he had with a circular lawn and path around it. But there seems to have been a, a, a kind of a wilder part, a bit further down the garden with uh, trees and, and bushes. And there's a really intriguing photograph showing gate into <laughs> woodland garden and we're not quite sure exactly what that consisted of but there had been a network of gardens all through that part of Paris in earlier years and uh, it may have been part of the Abbey au Bois for example. Anyway there's clearly both a kind of cultivated part and a freer growing part. There are the roses around the walls growing up against the walls climbing rambling other plants growing up the porch made of lattice work that Beatrix had, had created for the house. 
um, it would have been quite an evocative environment. And there's Verpool's very interesting comment about Whistler going hand in hand with Beatrix round the garden and um, she would calm him down after a hard day's work. And uh, the, the sort of sense of the emotive effect of the garden on the individual, again, is something that really takes us right into science at the time because Darwin, again, is writing about the um, affectiveness, the way that an environment will shape an organism and an organism responds to an environment. So consciously or not, Whistler is part of that story and his, his kind of use of the garden as not just a backdrop, but an effective space that's nice to be in, that to entertain visitors and guests to walk around, to you know relax in just as we do today, but also to be inspired by, to create what he called songs on stone. That was the name he gave uh, his set of lithographs in the 1890s, which included a lot of the garden subjects at the Rue du Bac. Interaction of figures and environment is very, very clear in the images. And even where he's just looking from the porch into the garden, he'll include a figure of a, a man with a sickle who's cutting the grass in the good old fashioned way. Uh, and he looks often from a, a sideways view at a slight angle as though he's slightly eavesdropping over friends who are there. So yes, he's stepping aside, he's observing, and yet he's part of it. And so often he'll include his own little butterfly signature flitting in as though it's literally part of the scene. Mm -hmm. the, the future is a really interesting prospect because now we've begun to open up the idea of Whistler nature and science. It's become abundantly clear from the fascinating papers that the speakers gave in Cambridge at the Fitzwilliam that there's a lot more still to be explored and found out. And Glasgow is the ideal place really to take that forward in conjunction with the exhibition when it comes to, to the Hunterian there because it's a, a city that's built on technology, shipbuilding, uh, iron making, dyeing, all sorts of really exciting 19th century um, innovations are found in Glasgow. So we thought we would take the logic of that forward and look at Whistler with um, rivers, shipping, industry, technology, and gardens and botany, of course, are all part of that. And the, the kind of context that Whistler's working in in Paris in the 1890s will be featured in the exhibition again with Rue back scenes and some of the um, visitors to the garden can be explored then in papers potentially at our, our further conference study day event. Uh, so it's all in the making but we think it will provide some really new interesting um, expansion of what we began to explore in the Whistler Nature and Science study day.